So uh, could you tell me what are uh, the causes of the dramatic increase in the number of foreign fighters who come to join the Islamic State from uh, European countries? Why do you think it happens now? And uh, I'm interested if you know the spreading ideology of the Islamic State is the only underlying cause for that. Well, I think we should be um, we should be aware that there have been uh, very many young people in in our societies that were always ready to engage in in any such uh, violent uh, adventures. The uh, phenomenon of a foreign fighter is actually a quite old one, going back a uh, hundred years. And uh, as we speak, and uh, uh, today, and as we mostly refer to Syria. Uh, we should also be aware that in Ukraine we have, of course, another front line where you have uh, very many foreign fighters that are actually as risky as a target group uh, that tend to belong to uh, to neo-Nazi and far-right extremist uh, uh, young men mostly. So I think uh, the foreign fighters have been around all the time and they have uh, come from a certain groups of higher society that uh, uh, encompassed a uh, disenfranchised and uh, disgruntled young men, mostly increasingly also women. So the problem is not new, but as our societies actually grow more and more um, unequal in terms of what um, they grant as an opportunity for young people, these kind of phenomena will naturally increase. Uh, how do you see the future of European Muslim communities? How to prevent young uh, European Muslims from radicalization into militant Islamism? Well, the communities themselves, if we single out the uh, Muslim community, as we could also do with certain other communities that tend to produce right-wing extremists, I think the community uh, has a, a very important role, as has the family in that community where these young people uh, come from. Um, so I would recommend just any, uh, any local authority and governance to make sure to establish a very well-going and trusted relationship with key figures of uh, whatever community we are talking about and make sure to not only liaise with uh, the established and somewhat older representatives of that communities, but make sure to also engage with representatives of the young people in that community so that you have somebody to talk to in case something uh, serious is happening or also in case just to do normal um, uh, inner diplomatic work uh, uh, with the community and, and among the communities. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, what should Europe do in order to provide security for its citizens? Well, that is a rather broad question. If I um, look at what we are doing at the Vaticalization Awareness Network, the, the so-called RAN network, um, which is a practitioner network being uh, established, uh, having been established in uh, 2011 um, by the European Commission, um, the working groups refer to the specific areas that need attention. Um, uh, certainly, your teachers and everybody in education is very important for that business. So make sure that you have uh, trainings uh, in place for teachers that uh, uh, want and need to engage more with issues of violent extremism. Um, family health care, community work, uh, all these workers are tremendously important. There's another working group on that. Uh, of course, people that work in prisons um, and correctional institutions uh, need to be able to act as first responders, need to be able to interact with a very difficult, but after all quite worthwhile, uh, group of young people who have an idea about how this society or the world should be like. It might be a, a quite uh, a peculiar idea that is very risky, but at least they do care and they need to be interacted with. Um, other working groups actually refer to uh, community police. Uh, as a policeman, there's many things I can do wrong, I can do right in interacting with, uh, with young people. Um, so just look at the areas in which you have many practitioners that interact with these kinds of young people naturally, including, for instance, also health care and mental health care, and make sure that they understand well what the issue is and how to best respond to it. 
uh, could you describe the process of radicalization into militant Islamism? Like where it starts, how it develops, uh, if there are any indicators uh, in common, any recognizable milestones, for example? Well, basically, if um, I think uh, the objective really is to take care of your young people, especially those that from very early on, and very early on means pre pre school and elementary school, show signs of uh, um, of behavior, but that that is in a general sort um, fragile or gives you concerns. Um, the, the, the root causes are much discussed about. Usually they tend to um, go back to some tensions within the family, then they go back to some tensions even in the deeper history of that family, going back intergenerationally at least three generations, especially with immigrant populations that have in their family histories issue of civil war uh, and, and other kinds of warfare. Um, so there are very many different factors that play out uh, once a person then come age 14, 15, 16 gets into a process of intense uh, radicalization. You need to be aware of these uh, uh, factors and need to deal with them. Uh, could you tell us how uh, the radicalization strategies work, uh, if uh, there is any general uh, one-size-fits-all uh, approach or uh, are the de-radicalization strategies tailor-made to fit uh, an individual, let's say? Uh, basically, you, um, and that's actually quite hopeful, you work with, with all sorts of, of uh, young violent extremists pretty much the same way, you know, be it neo-Nazi right-wing extremists or be it AQ, Al-Qaeda related or ISIS related young people. You have to make sure that you establish a relationship of trust to them, uh, be it face to face or be it in small groups as I prefer to work as a practitioner. Um, make sure that you as a practitioner uh, are independent uh, or put it differently as a government or as a local authority. Make sure that the practitioners you work with are independent and can actually grant confidentiality in their work. Then make sure that you are uh, leveling an approach uh, to them that is respectful and is open process. Open process meaning that you don't go in there with a certain syllabus or a session plan, but you make sure that the needs and issues on the part of your clients um, are worked with, because they will lead you directly to the hot spots that you need to touch upon if you want to make a change with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, what other challenges to Europe's internal security besides the rise of uh, militant Islamism uh, can you see nowadays? Well, there are many challenges, and not being a foreign policy expert, I would probably only single out one that is closest related. Um, and I would think that organized crime, uh, by and large, is just the infrastructure. Uh, organized crime and corruption is the infrastructure upon which violent extremism and all sorts of other problems mm -hmm. grow uh, very fast. Uh, so make sure that you get a grip on that and uh, you'll have a much easier time in actually getting disengagement and prevent work on the ground. And uh, do you think that uh, the conference on internal security issues is important nowadays? Well, yes, indeed. We need to do more conferencing. We need even to do more different conferencing of a sort that we haven't seen much yet. And once again, I refer to the Radicalization Awareness Network, which has basically started on, to, on the level of two, two basic objectives. The first was, <coughs> or basic statements, actually. The first was that policymakers in Brussels said, well, we really don't know anything about that. And the second thing about violent extremism, what you do, the second thing they said is, but we know that you practitioners who work on the ground with the young people of concern know most about it. Um, now, why do I say that here? I think the conferencing that, that we need to establish and, and create is a conferencing of workshops in which practitioners play a leading role and in which field practitioners, first-line practitioners from the ground are able to communicate 
with each other and then give their message to policymakers. So if you have a conference as we have one today, just look in the round and do some sort of practitioner mainstreaming just as we used to do it with your male and female participants. Just look around uh, with the question of, you know, are there enough women in the room would now be, are there enough practitioners in the room? Or is it just you know, one to ten, as it usually tends to be? Um, so conferencing, more internal security conferencing, yes, but certainly of a different kind that we did it so far.